Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Austin. And I'm Max. And today we're doing The Stranger on the Third Floor. Woo! Our first movie with Peter Lorre and the first film noir. Not the first film noir that we've done on the show, though. No. In fact, we've done more film noirs than I think we would even, like, really, uh, I, like, account for. Because we've done, what, Ministry of Fear, The Killing... Uh, detour, which was a pretty good episode. But also, if you think about it, Max, that one segment at the end of The Bandwagon, it was also kind of a film noir, wasn't it? You could also kind of make an argument for like Strangers on a Train or something like that. Yeah, yeah. maybe Hitchcock is probably adjacent to film noir. But this is material that we've kind of covered before, but this is one of the more interesting examples of film noir, not only because it's the first one chronologically, um, at least that's what we're going to be arguing today, uh, but also because it has these interesting features that kind of make it separate from what you would think of as a, as a typical noir movie. And perhaps that's why this movie, Stranger on the Third Floor, has so often been overlooked at people looking at the uh, canon of film noir, uh, which of course was only constructed re retroactively to begin with. So of course it's going to be sort of an arbitrary category that excludes some things and includes other things and you can argue about it as much as you want however i think we i can speak for both of us when i say that this is a pretty good movie and uh it's a lot of fun to watch and i think if you're not interested in noir normally this is something i would i would recommend to you yes uh take it from me somebody who is far less familiar with film noir than austin is i have said on record on the spectator film podcast before that my favorite noir movie is who framed roger rabbit uh, I stand by that statement. Which some people would even argue with you saying that's not a real noir movie, that's a neo-noir movie. Yes, I, I don't care, though. <laughs> <laughs> it is a great movie. The French can get tired of watching Lenny Riefenstahl films and then say that Americans were doing oh, high this? art. Max, you're the <laughs> one who usually praises the French. I insult them. I know, but the whole film noir movement came out because they were tired of watching the fucking Nazi films they had been forced to watch for the past several Give years. Give us something else. <laughs> so they, they ascribed artistic meaning to a whole generation of American films they had missed out on. But this movie is a wonderful jumping off point into film noir. Uh, most importantly, I think, if you want to get into it, this movie is blissfully short and to the point and structured. Um, there is not really a bit of fat on this movie. You could argue a little bit at the beginning and a little bit at the end, but that just sort of builds up the character and the world. Um, there's not amazing acting except from Peter Lorre, but that performance really carries the latter half of the film. He's really amazing all the time. And yeah. the German expressionist style lighting and just sort of shot composition that would become a staple of film noir later is very present in this movie and very entertaining. So yeah, if you do really want to get into film noir, I think this is a great springboard, honestly. Yeah. And that German expressionist sort of style is something we're going to be talking about a lot uh, during the commentary track. And of course that, that lineage of German expressionism to noir, which is something that was often talked about has been hotly debated <laughs> by uh, critics and scholars. So um, needless to say, I think the influence is kind of clear here. In fact, the director, Boris Engster, worked at Ufa Studios um, however many years prior before he came to the United States. So I think you can draw a pretty clear line there, also with Peter Lorre working uh, in a lot of German Expressionist movies as well. So um, I think the interesting thing about you saying that, though, that I do really want to hit home on in the introduction as far as recommending this movie to people who might not like noir normally is how phantasmagorical it's noir aesthetic really is. And part of that has to do with that. Um, I don't know, leaning in a little bit more to the expressionist side of that lineage than other noir films, which tend to aim for a little bit more of a sense of realism or hard boiled realism, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a really great movie. Like you said, it's only an hour. You've got these great performances and uh, it's just a lot of fun to watch. Um, but before we, unless you have anything else to say. No, let's let's jump in. Before we jump to add. in, I do want to touch on a concept that we've talked about a lot in the show. Give a little refresher for our audience. 
Uh, and that concept is the uncanny because the uncanny plays a large role in how this movie is structured. And I think its treatment of the uncanny is something that separates it from a lot of other noir movies. So that's going to be important as we discuss it throughout the commentary track. And folks, make sure you listen to this because even I get fuzzy in my definition of the uncanny. <laughs> well, the so. thing about having a funny, uh, fuzzy definition of the uncanny is that a lot of people do, including critics, because it was a concept started by Freud, uh, Freud with his mountains of cocaine. And uh, he kind of lost interest in it and moved on to something else. So it's kind of open-ended. So there's a lot of room for interpretation, unfortunately. When Freud was writing about it originally, he was talking about like uh, sort of paranoid neurotic behaviors. Um, He was talking about like surmounted uh, uh, systems of belief and uh, superstition. Uh, And that's what he was talking about when he was writing about the uncanny. So like an example of what he meant when he was talking about the uncanny was this importance of the self, an over-evaluation of the importance of the self in the world. Maybe a relatable example of this for a lot of people is like your dad watching sports. And when your dad is watching sports and he's rooting for his team and he sits in his lucky chair and they start to win... That is an example of what Freud would have termed uncanny because it's like you're not doing anything. This is a superstition. It doesn't mean anything. You're over-evaluating your own behavior in the importance of the world. It doesn't mean anything. However, there's a flip side to that. That is an example of the uncanny where somebody is using a superstition to achieve something positive, right? The other side of it is this neurotic, paranoid delusion that Freud would sometimes run into with some of his patients where, you know, they think people are after them and they're really paranoid and think there's some sort of conspiracy coming to get them. And that's also the part where the term of like the uncanny sort of crosses over and becomes useful for a lot of film scholars, especially when they're talking about horror or thrillers. Um, And the idea is like, once again, you're, you're over evaluating your importance in the world those people are not actually following you. You're not actually being stalked by anyone. You're just being paranoid. Um, and this is something that's used to describe the subtext and the, the way that different movies work uh, whenever they have some sort of conspiracy plot or horror plot. Probably one of the best examples is Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where it seems like it could be this uncanny thing, uh, but it proves to be actually real. Somebody thinks that there's a carbon copy of their spouse, and they're like, oh, my God, it's not my spouse. It's very easy to look at that and be Al- like, that's just uncanny. Although that could be applied because Invasion of the Body Snatchers is one of the best examples of a Red Scare film. Yes. And that could be applied to just the general social phenomenon of the Red Scare of seeing communists yeah. in the mists. Well, I think, any there. I think you could equally apply that concept to, like you're saying, any sort of discourse about the Red Scare or pretty much anything where people are suspicious or like xenophobic about something, right? And it becomes this thing where it's like this formal, this formerly familiar object or phenomena is now made kind of dis, uh, disturbing to you because you think there's something bizarre or strange hidden underneath it. Uh, and the other last thing to mention about the uncanny is how it's specifically one of the... Um, epitomizing representations of the uncanny is the figure of the double or the doppelganger. Why? Because once again, it is something where it is taking that sort of body snatcher idea to the next step. It's not just that I'm overvaluating my importance in the world. It's that, oh my God, my superstitions and that paranoia is literally embodied in an identical copy of me that is going out and doing things that it's not me. And what does it want with me? What is the connection between the two of us? That's how it works with the doppelganger. And this movie makes use of a lot of that because there's a lot of doubling between the the main characters in the movie. So, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it with the uncanny. We've talked about it on other episodes. You can go back to listen to like our uh, Carnival of Souls episodes or uh, our episode on society where it's big in both of those. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And that's something that's going to be very useful to uh, return to throughout the commentary track. So I think if we're ready to jump in, Max... We can uh, uh, jump off the third floor balcony or whatever the fuck, (laughs) whatever transition we want to go with. (laughs) Great, uh, great one, Austin. Let's just go. (laughs) Let's jump off the balcony. The movie Uh, has started. I wish, I know you have to do this for legal reasons and for company 
dick waving things, but I wish oh my more God, movies why? just started like this. Oh, he, you mean without like a, a studio tag at the beginning? Yeah, without like fucking fanfare. Look how great we are. We yeah. made you this product. You know, sometimes there's not just the uh, studio tag, but even if you want to mess with the credits, there can be severe consequences. George Lucas, I think he got removed from the uh, uh, director's guild for having no credits at the beginning of Star Wars because he wanted the crawl. And that was honestly one of the few smart decisions that he did originally have for that yeah. movie. So, uh, you know, sometimes you have to take risks to do stuff. And I kind of agree with you. I think it would be more interesting if we could get away with that. But uh, there are certain standards and everything. And you're right. There are legal ramifications. However, Max, this credit sequence is interesting because it's the first instance of doubling in this movie. We open and we go to this window with a silhouette of what is, we would assume, is uh, John McGuire as Ward, um, our main character. Uh, in this window, and it's over the title of Stranger on the Third Floor. And I think that the implication of that credit sequence is kind of like, wait, is he the Stranger on the Third Floor? We would learn that he isn't. However, it creates this pattern of doubling where, you know, both Meng and Peter Lorre and Elisha Cook Jr., all, they all become doubles for this Ward character, and they all sort of are equalized by the end of the movie. And you, hopefully you would understand as an audience member that uh, the ideas of innocence and guilt uh, under the eyes of the law and under our normal common sense standards have been complicated and are more nuanced than at the start of the movie. It's not as simple as simply condemning someone. I also want to point out this scene is like very flatly lit. It's very bright and it's the happiest <laughs> this movie will be until the very, very end of it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because there's an incredible stylistic contrast between these early scenes. And then it kind of hits you like a brick wall um, right after they get out of the trial. And they go and basically once Ward starts ruminating and his girlfriend's uh, words sort of start to sink their way into his head. He's like, wait a second, what if he is guilty? Immediately, the shadows just jump up on the wall and it becomes an actual noir movie. And I really like that contrast. However, it does set it apart from other noir movies, which would start with a very brooding narration, uh, which this movie does not have. Uh, and they would have a, they would telegraph their sense of doom and gloom from the outset, where this movie does not. Which, again, is one of the things that I think separates it from a lot of other noir movies. And is perhaps why earlier on some people might not be as willing to have categorized it as noir. Now, I think the way that it goes between the wide shot and then her close up uh, is kind of interesting. And I think it hints at the idea of the uncanny because you have the wide shot of them talking together about this thing that happened right in the newspaper. You have the surface level story. This guy killed them and Ward is certain of it. It's like, certainly he killed Nick. And then we go for the close up. Once you look a little bit closer, you're like, wait, does that exactly make sense? And that's what we're getting with her. And she's the voice of the conscience that is going to drive uh, Nick's ruminations later and kind of his paranoia. Um, so the movie's very interested in basically peeling those layers in a very self-conscious way. And I think it makes it very interesting. Um, another interesting thing about that opening sequence, Max, is it introduces this pattern we're going to see throughout the movie of this back and forth between public and private space which is, I think, a key part of this movie's anxiety over uh, the state of modernity and, like, city life, where you have her saving her seat for her boyfriend, and people ask, hey, is this seat taken? And some react kind of rudely to it, or some people are okay with it. But the idea is that they do not have a proper private space and therefore come under the eyes of other people. And that's this whole movie, is, like, when you're in a tight sort of uh, collected space with a lot of other people... Uh, we start to project things onto one another and it becomes very easy to vilify one another and treat the, treat each other um, as just spectacles that we encounter, you know, and not actual members of community. As a smoker myself, I have to say, like, <laughs> I can only imagine how terrible every building in the past smelled where everybody was constantly chain smoking and it const just like never stopping. Yeah, we still got that one brick on the ceiling in Grand Central to remind us. Yeah, I, I find it every single time I'm there. And you're like, God damn, what was that like? Yeah. <laughs> I still remember as a kid, I could barely remember it, just smoking areas and restaurants. Oh, yeah. And it didn't yeah. matter at all because it would still fill the entire restaurant. Yeah, it but... always bothered the shit out of me. See, I um, liked the smell even when I was a kid <laughs> a little bit. I might have so. been too young to even understand what yeah. it was, to be honest with you. Uh, but needless to say, that that scene where we see the uh, reporters 
and we're introduced to them is kind of a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a joke, but it's a bit of a clear visual metaphor where they're playing a game and it's like, oh, they're gambling with this man's life. A metaphor for cash out. You got a $12 raise. That's ex- crazy for today. Yeah. Well, actually, it depends on what his, like, you know, uh, what periodic, like, what is the the measurement by how he gets paid? Does he get paid, like, once per week or what? Or is it, like, per column or whatever? Yeah. I don't know. That's still pretty good. I'll take $12 extra for anything. Yeah. Frankly. Now, in this trial scene, I want to point out a sort of introduce, uh, an interesting formal conceit that I think you can notice here where you just have this subtle alignment of Elisha Cook Jr. and our main character, John McGuire, on the left-hand side, and you have the prosecution on the right. And once John McGuire officially condemns Elisha Cook Jr., he is pictured on the right with the prosecution. But I think it is a little subtle hint that they are kind of more closely related than John McGuire would like to originally think. Uh, However, I do want to point out that this moment in terms of the performance from John McGuire, I fucking hate it because he is blinking nonstop. What the fuck are you doing? Stop blinking, motherfucker. Stop it. You are not Ansel Elgort. You're not going to do this. I still feel bad for Ansel Elgort. Don't. His parents named him Ansel Elgort. Well, it was his... You know what? The thing is, he fills out his name. That's the fucking problem. Also, he has all those like sexual assault things about him, so fuck him. Oh, okay. And he made Sorry, a rap song about bathtubs. I can't keep track of all the sex pests in Hollywood anymore. It's it's a little bit, little bit hard. Yeah. I just, I'm just i just going to assume every prominent actor is a sex pest until I'm <laughs> proven otherwise. But anyway, Max, I want to quote a passage here from the book Mythologies by Roland Bardes, which I've brought up in the past, but there's a few essays in this book that really speak to some things going on in this this uh, movie. And this one is from Dominici or the triumph of literature in which Roland Barthes talks about the discourse around this uh, trial in France. And he writes the whole Dominici trial was performed according to a certain idea of psychology, which happens as if by accident to be that of the properties of bourgeois literature, material proofs being uncertain or contradictory recourse was had to mental proofs. We are to find these, if not in the very mentality of the accusers. Therefore, the motives and sequence of actions were reconstructed with a free hand, but without the shadow of a doubt. A procedure like that of those archaeologists who gather old stones from all over an excavation site and with their quite modern cement erect a delicate wayside altar to Sesotris, or whatever, however the fuck that's pronounced, or even reconstruct a religion dead for 2,000 years by consulting the remains of universal wisdom, which is in fact only their own wisdom, elaborated in the academies of the third republic and then on the next page he writes uh uh that merely to base an archaeological reconstruction or a novel on a why not harms no one but justice periodically some trial and not necessarily a fictional one like the one in camus the stranger comes to remind you that justice is always ready to lend you a spare brain in order to condemn you without a second thought and that like corniel it depicts you as you ought to be and not as you are. And I think that's referring to the uh, to the tragedian from the 18th century, um, Corniel, or however the fuck you say his name. But the point of bringing that up, Max, that I find really interesting for this movie is not just how much of it on a literal level relates to what's happening in this trial, where they're, like we said, they're projecting this idea of this Elisha Cook Jr. character as a murderer onto Elisha Cook Jr., right? They're connecting these dots and and projecting that onto him but also it's the idea that that projection is kind of like a fictional double so it's another instance of the doubling the way other people interact with you and see you is as much of a part of like a double of you as uh someone who's literally kind of similar to you you know and i just find that interesting and i find the process of examining that in the urban setting kind of interesting because it relates to this very Kafka-esque idea of how people interact with each other and institutions, you know? And that's at home with this movie because I think compared to a lot of other noirs, this is a very Kafka-esque movie. Oh, 100%. Yeah. We'll get that much <laughs> a little bit later in the film. I think this is the first time we've seen Elisha Cook Jr., by the way, who I love as an actor. He's so, I don't want to sound mean, but he's he's so great at portraying an idea of like, patheticness yes well he has um, a boy a very boyish face and yes just like yes, yes oh i don't know what's going on 
Yeah, he's very good at playing it up. He he's not the best actor in this film, but he he is what I would say carries the early part of the movie, and he does uh, put that doubt in your mind as an audience member of whether this was so clear or not and whether or not we can trust the protagonist, which is important in this movie. Yeah, I think it's as important as Peter Lorre's role, even though I think one is more challenging than the other. You know, for Peter Lorre to engender sympathy is one thing, but for him to engender sympathy, I think it's a little bit more expected, where it's like, okay, we know that the movie's going to be playing us with some sort of irony about this guy maybe not being guilty, right? We sort of expect that because that's how you would expect a story to unfold. You start at point A and then you move to point B. That's just how it's going to go. But you also need someone good enough to actually pull that off in a way that's convincing despite the fact that you might anticipate it. And that's why Elisha Cook Jr. is good. And I think what you're talking about comparing him to um, Peter Lorre is interesting because it's like, I don't know, I think it it shows something about the way that this movie really casts through typage. Um, and, and how those performances are sort of uh, organized uh, and why those two performances stick out is because the, the actors involved really are really in touch with like a level of their own physicality that makes them unique and they can take advantage of it to portray a specific thing in a way that I, I don't think that John McGuire can. <laughs> Understandable. Yeah. Uh, I think John McGuire is mostly fine with the exception of the uh, courtroom scene, but I think he is also the weakest performance. Even Margaret uh, Talishet or Talche, I'm not how you pronounce that. I even think that she's better, um, but maybe that's just more interesting to me because she's actually the voice of reason in this. Um, and she's the one who is uh, urging him to dig a little bit deeper. I think this movie might've been improved if you had someone else other than John McGuire, because Something that I think is easy to sort of gloss over, kind of stumble upon in this movie, is how John McGuire really does have a fucking mental meltdown in this movie. Like, he goes full, like, paranoid meltdown. Yeah. And I think maybe an actor that could have internalized that a little bit better might have communicated what's happening a little bit more naturally so it wouldn't seem like as much of a contrivance. Yeah, because he's stone-faced for the majority of the film until he breaks down in that one moment. And even then, he's like, oh, wait, my favorite character is speaking. Oh, cynical reporter man. Yeah. (laughs) Just like, who cares if we execute the wrong guy? There's too many people anyway. (laughs) Fuck it. We got to get rid of someone. Yeah. (laughs) Just like, I can't believe he said that. Jesus fucking Christ. And the funny thing is that in the flashback, that guy has the gall to chastise him about, like, very um, pervertedly fondling a knife and talking about how he wants to slit Meng's throat. Yeah. It's like, okay, you're the guy who's doing like the eco-fascism shit. <laughs> you goddamn weirdo. I actually Googled eco-fascism recently. Oh to, man, what happened? I, I went down a rabbit hole and it's just like, do we really need to invent new kinds of fascism? <laughs> just like... I think the thing is less inventing new kinds of fascism and helping people realize how many things that we just take for granted in everyday life are fo- like forms of it or lead to it. I get that. And it's yeah. good to identify like separate movements as yeah. coherent with fascism. But like eco fascism is just like there are people who actually like it's not just used as people who are like advocate eugenics in terms of saving the planet. Like there are people who just believe it as an ideology. And I'm just oh, and like, they're like, this is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's like people on, uh, one of the funniest subreddits to me is uh, r slash neoliberal. <laughs> it's people like, we're like, yeah, we're neoliberals. And they're like, man, I wish Joe Biden was a neoliberal. That'd be so cool. She's like, you guys have no idea what you're talking about. The scales of justice. This is definitely a very silent movie thing yeah. to dolly in very dramatically. Oh, here we have the shift, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Into the uh, noir lighting. The cinematographer on this movie, I'm okay. I'm going to butcher his name. Nicholas Musaraka, amazing cinematographer. And uh, he would come to define a lot of RKO's most significant movies throughout the 40s. Um, Maybe his best known work is with Val Luton in some of his horror movies. But he also worked on stuff like Out of the Past, another really great noir movie, and The Hitchhiker, directed by Ida Lupino, which is a really amazing movie. And Weirdly, the outlier here is The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer. Uh, Bobby's, yeah, Bobby Soxer, <laughs> whatever the fuck that well, is. Well, you were saying that it's such a drastic change, but in the courtroom, there's a nice little lighting trick besides like the harsh lighting on the scales of justice as we pan up there. But uh, the blinds 
are over the like the shadow of the That's blinds right. are over the witness they stand. Got the Venetians already to show you the well, yeah. Venetians are a staple of <laughs> noir movies in yeah. general. Yeah, but also it's like yeah. it's kind of like bars already. It's bars yeah. and it's casting. Yeah, almost doubtful lighting on yeah. the testimony. And it's interesting there. you say that because you actually see it's less conspicuous, but you see those Venetians kind of pronounced behind uh, the Ward character when he's saying to the reporters in the back room, he's like, wait a second, this is not about me cynically doing this. I actually saw him do that. Yeah. The thing with Ward is that he actually thinks he's doing the right thing and that he's sure in his own mind. Ward is not yet being cynical, unlike his reporter friends. He actually thinks he's doing the right thing. Um, and then, like you're saying, you sort of have this transition. You have that dark emotional moment where, once again, Elisha Cook Jr. is very good at, if not a listening, eliciting a form of pathos, really just seem incredibly pathetic and small. And uh, that emotional moment really also helps sell the dramatic change in the lighting, I think. Now, this part of the movie is very interesting to me because I think this foreshadows other forms of, like, detective and crime stories, specifically, Max, the Jalo film. And I'm going to quote from a book called Giallo, Genre Modernity and Detection in Italian Horror cin Cinema by Alexia Canas. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's probably my favorite book on the Giallo genre, um, and it's very new. I would definitely recommend it, blanket recommendation. But one of the interesting things she talks about is this idea of the flaneur, um, this French term that was sort of pioneered by uh, Charles Baudelaire, and then Walter Benjamin wrote about it. Um, but uh, basically the idea is uh, of someone who goes around and tours the city and treats it kind of as like a spectacle and just witnesses the sights of the city. But there's this key idea that they are sort of remain, they remain detached from the spectacle they're witnessing. Um, and it's a specific type of voyeurism, um, as well in actually, I, I'm not sure I need to quote from the book directly, but I, if you want to learn more about it, you should check it out in there because it plays a role in the giallo genre as well, where you have a lot of people just cruising around the city, uh, witnessing things and a lot of Jalo movies will hinge on the witnessing of a crime, right? And if you think about it, Max, what is the pivoting moment of this movie? It is the same thing as like in Bird of the Crystal Plumage, where he sees a crime, but he misrecognizes who was responsible and what happened. And the rest of the movie is him revising that original scene that he witnessed. It is kind of like a Jalo movie. Yeah. Which is interesting. And of course, Jalo, much like noir, is a genre with all these interesting uh, cross-pollinations that sort of pour into it, you know? I definitely, Jalo is indebted to noir as much as it is indebted to, you know, um, exploitation movies or, or Hitchcock movies or what have you. And like noir, the definition of what a Jalo is changes a lot. And yeah. some of the most notable ones kind of go outside the box for what is normally considered one. Yeah. Like, yeah. Because if you bring up noir movies, most of the time people are going to think of just like the most stereotypical, like a detective smoking a cigarette in a Venetian blind. They're going to think of it. that short segment uh, at the end of the bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. The girl hunt or whatever that was called. Or the fake movie in, oh, Angels with Dirty Souls. Right? <laughs> From Home Alone. Yeah. <laughs> That's the most recent noir movie we've done. All right, Johnny, I'm going. I'll give you to the town of count of 10. How old were you when you found out that wasn't a real movie? <laughs> oh, very recently. I can't remember exactly when, but within the last few years. I did find out there is like a 15-minute version of that thing that yeah. like exists somewhere that I would like. I think we mentioned that in our We should do an track. episode on that. If we can find a clip of it, then yeah, yeah. I, I would gladly do that. So good. It's a bonus episode. So the interesting thing about him being this figure of the Flinner who sort of tours the city and, and treats it as like this spectacle that they have this ditch, detached relationship with is how it engages in the same sort of voyeurism that is like characteristic of all the characters in this movie. This movie is all about like the relationship between modernity and your ability to maintain clear perception and vision. One of the first things that Ward says 
when he meets his girlfriend at the diner is he's talking about how like, oh man, when we get that kitchen and we got our table and we're sitting across from one another, we'll actually be able to sit and look at each other face to face. And it the movie punctuates that because it actually cuts to them looking at each other through the mirror behind the bar at the countertop, you know? And uh, vision is something that's repeatedly, you know, referred back to uh, in this movie as something that's changed by this interaction in the city setting. And, uh, of course, the Flaneur figure um, is someone who is an archetype that really engages with things in a primarily visual way. Of course, in this movie, um, the Observer character... Uh, the reporter, Ward, is almost treated by the state as a flaneur. Because if you remember, Max, the thing that's brought up in the trial is when he goes, now as a reporter, the prosecutor says this, now as a reporter, you're a trained observer of men. And, and then, then the defense attorney yes. does the only good thing he does in the movie and objects to yes. that. And it's kind of like they're trying to legally uh, substantiate his role as like a flaneur, as a reporter. Right, you're officially sanctioned in your job as this, and then the arc of for Ward and the rest of the movie is that that distance he has to the subject, to the spectacle that he's profiting off of and benefiting from, is going to collapse. He's going to become involved. He's going to become the spectacle that he previously had reported on in this kind of Kafka-esque nightmarish way. What oh, if Meg and Peter Laurie were just dating? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were making a lot of jokes uh, before the commentary track began about sexualizing Albert Meng because we thought it was very funny. And I coined the phrase Meng exploitation, which honestly would have loved to have seen some of it. Yeah, just, you know, got to get a splash of his milk to <laughs> help you sleep like a innocent not, babe. Not so innocent babe. <laughs> well, like, what? A, imagine, Daddy's milk. Imagine that different movie if you just like. He decided to walk in, and that's just like... They're fucking. They're fucking. And he's like, oh, oh. Peter Lorre dipping his nutsack in some milk, just dragging it across Meng's face. I said you couldn't have women in here, but I never said anything about other men. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's Meng's whole purpose in this, is like he's trying to seduce Ward, and he's like, drive the women out of here. <laughs> what a nightmare. That actor is uh, Charles Helton, I believe his name is, and we've seen him before, Max. Uh, for anyone who's interested in Meng exploitation, you can go check out our episode on To Be or Not To Be, in which he is the theater director, Dobosh. He's the one with the great line about how he doesn't smell Hitler in him. I love that. That was, oh my God, forever ago. That's such a fucking funny movie. It is. That like influenced so many of Mel Brooks's movies later on. Yeah. And Mel Brooks, of course, went on to remake To Be or Not To Be with his wife. Yeah, that Bancroft. That that was a movie. <laughs> Maybe not as successful as the yeah. Ernst Lubitsch one, but you know what? Mel has never been shy. So no. <laughs> that's that's his weakness and his strength, I would say. The other interesting thing I noticed about this movie is how it uses sound. I found that very interesting, the way it communicates sound and relate sound to senses of like subjectivity. And there's a little bit of crossover in that conversation with the way it plays with voiceover narration, because there really isn't any voiceover narration in this. And that is one of the biggest features that we associate with the noir movie. What we get instead is interior monologue. And even still, it's not truly Ward's interior monologue. We get his thoughts, and sometimes it's his monologue, but other times we just straight up hear dialogue from other characters sort of echoing at around and reverberating through his head you know and it's a very interesting sort of take on that noir type of narration because usually it's something that relates more to like a masculine subjectivity and it reinforces a masculine subjectivity whereas in this it's it's more like it's just about his mind crumbling you know speaking of which he's doing the i'm losing my mind pose right now against the wall <laughs> i'm hiding against the wall where no one can see me <laughs> you know what though i i mean you can maybe poke at this, but I think the weirdly contrived and obviously paranoid uh, meltdown that he's having, where it's like, why would you think that he's dead? You have no re reason to assume that and be this paranoid. I think the way he's having this meltdown also harkens back to maybe some German expressionist um, influence, where those movies are less about the plausibility 
of what's happening on a plot level, on a literal level, and it's more about the thematic re- resonance of what's happening. You know, it's like it's it's valuing over a plot, um, over a plausibility level, the uh, thematic power of like, oh man, what if he does report on this thing and the same thing happens to him, and he becomes the thing that he was reporting on? You know, that's what it's about. And it's about putting him through this melodramatic experience of this sort of oniric uh, nightmare. I don't, on, on on the side, I don't know if I believe Peter Laurie could have nearly cut this guy's head off. I, I, I don't think he has the strength in him to do it. I don't know. Peter Laurie's physicality is very interesting as an actor. It's always interesting to see what people expect of him in terms of his performance. Um, also because throughout his career, his weight would change so drastically, uh, at different moments. Um, and, uh, you know, he was always so self-conscious and deliberate in the way he was able to wrap his physicality into a performance, usually with like a sinister character. And, uh, I don't know. I'm always interested to see how people respond to him. Getting lunch with his psychopath friend. You shouldn't drink coffee before going to bed. Milk's the thing. Daddy's milk. <laughs> Make you sleep like an innocent baby. You know what? I like this new headcanon where Meng is just a, a hope- sex maniac. No, not even a sex maniac. Just a hopeless homosexual in <laughs> fucking 1930s New York. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be too... It would be par for the course for Noir to have a character that no one likes who's kind of a dandy. Queer coded, yeah. Yes. Queer coding was a big thing in Noir, actually. That's, what? That was my favorite Pride Month joke I saw, by the way. What? Was the, you're telling me a queer coded this? No. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a second, but there you, you go. know what? That's okay. Um, but, Max, uh, if you recall, one of the prep episodes we did was probably featured one of the most famous uh, noir dandies uh, as uh, Waldo Lidecker in Laura. That is Jesus Christ. That's yes. been so long. In fact, uh, Peter Lorre himself in the Maltese Falcon is definitely queer coded as Joel Cairo as well, where he has those interesting comments about how, uh, you know, um, Humphrey Bogart punches him out and he's like, look what you did to my shirt. You got blood on my shirt. Or oh, when, um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Or, I'm having flashbacks now. <laughs> yeah. It's been or a when, while like, since um, that. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Humphrey Bogart, like, sniffs his business card and he's like, says to his secretary, gardenias or something. It's like, okay, so a gay person would have their business card sent to his flowers. We get it. Thank you. Thank you, movie. Now, Max, there's another interesting way to look at these flashback sequences. And this is something that some critics have hit upon where they, they look at um, the treatment of Mang in these sequences as kind of like a distortion or secondary revision where they look at the ward character as containing this kind of like frustration associated with unfulfilled sexual desire. There's no sexual gratification in his current situation. And he's butting up against the kind of like bourgeois morality that limits him. And he can't express his sexuality with uh, the girl he likes. And then he sort of projects that onto Meng, who's constantly this like intrusive third who also, um, he kind of displaces his own sexuality, perhaps, onto Meng, because Meng is very clearly represented in a way that's, he just seems kind of like a pervert, you know? He's very explicitly voyeuristic. Yeah. You know, watching his neighbors. You have that comment when he goes into Nick's where uh, your favorite character makes a comment about him needing to get his mind laundered. Um, or his eyes laundered or whatever, because he's looking at those two girls, and I think he looks at one of them like Tara Stocking. Yeah, this one is, okay, this scene is uncomfortable in many ways. Why? Okay, well, first off, uh, um, Meng's annoying up until this point, but up until now, it's like, okay, he's a kind of uppity neighbor. Like, he doesn't like you using one of those ancient fucking super loud typewriters late at night. That sounds like gunfire. Yeah. Yeah. And sure. Those gas powered typewriters. That they <laughs> yes. <like them. laughs> but, um, and he's a bit weird and scolds you not to drink coffee late at night. And just, drink he just milk. wants to give you his milk. Yeah. Yeah. But like, that's like normal things. Like I can see that being a thing. Normal weird. Yeah. Th- this is when it 
steps into like, oh, okay, I understand why you really fucking hate. Like Mang he's now. invasive. Yeah. But the weird thing is that Ward makes that very like weird comment about like I would kill him if I had the chance. But he goes into so much detail. Yeah. He almost says it like fetishistically, where he's like, I would cut his throat and just like fuck the hole in his throat. But also like he like displaces him not getting any on Mang in this scene, but like his lady friend is like clearly deeply uncomfortable with this entire situation. And like, I don't think that's necessarily the case. She keeps pulling away and is just like changing the subject whenever he's just like, Oh, let's kiss. And she's like, Oh, I always wanted to see what your room looked like. I mean, I think she's hesitant, but also like, I don't know. It's, it's not quite clear that she's pulling away. Um, needless to say, I think the movie would still insist that her pulling away is, something that Meng is responsible for. I don't think the movie would imply that she is uncomfortable with Ward, merely uncomfortable with, again, the situation, this bourgeois uh, morality that is being imposed upon them and then being judged. Interestingly enough, uh, funny coincidence here, um, this woman, Margaret Talshet, uh, would go on, I believe, to marry uh, William Wyler, the famous director, of uh, the best days of our lives, among other things, such as Dead End, The Big Country, The Little Foxes, Ben Hur, oh okay, The Collector, uh, The Heiress, so many fucking movies. Okay, um, I just wanted some more. But of course, interesting fun fact here too is that Meng himself also appear- appears in the best years of our lives. And the 1937 William Wyler movie, Dead End, which stars none other than noir heavyweight Humphrey Bogart. So it all comes around. It all comes around. By the way, Dead End is an underrated William Wyler movie. uh, Because you got Humphrey Bogart in there, but you also got Sylvia Sidney, who you would probably know as like the grandma woman from Mars Attacks. Oh, (laughs) We've seen her on the show before where she's the secretary in hell in Beetlejuice. The old woman. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, Sylvia Cindy is such a delight. I love her. And she is so fucking funny in Mars Attacks, <laughs> where she's like playing someone who just doesn't know where she is. People try to talk to her, and she's just like, you're so cute. Ah, oh, that movie's so good. That's another... That's... Tim Burton, if Tim Burton wanted to make a comeback, he just has to go full stupid. Yeah. He just has to make a stupid movie that has Danny DeVito singing... Uh, uh, <laughs> what's the song <laughs> uh uh in las vegas it's not unusual to be loved, loved by, by anyone. anyone i love when danny devito starts <laughs> breaking out into singing that and then the aliens burst through the door <laughs> uh not what i expected to be talking about but it's all good that movie's fun I, oh my God. What? One of my friends just posted uh, they were watching Sweeney Todd for the first time the other day. Yes. And I'm just like, uh, the last the last good Tim Burton movie that will ever be. I wouldn't even necessarily say it's good. I would. I would say it's like I, I enjoy that real. Movie. The last real Tim Burton movie. I'm not saying it's bad. I wouldn't and say as it's far like, as Holly like Broadwood goes Holly or Broadway goes Hollywood goes, I would say it's one of the better adaptations. There's there's very of Sweeney Todd? Of just musical broadway musicals go hollywood it's it's very hard to do that and a lot of times things are lost in translation well maybe in the last however many years used to be the cream of the crop though. well yeah it used to be like that's that was the primary thing but like i'm saying in modern film sure modern it doesn't go so well because now they try to put in cgi and then you just get a situation where all your characters have cgi assholes then you're going back and forth about whether or not you're actually going to include the asshole in the final cut of the movie. And then you forget to actually make the movie good because you were focused on the assholes. <sighs> Hashtag release the butthole cut. It, didn't they release the butthole cut of cats? Just no. to let people know what we're talking. Oh, they didn't. No, they did not. Oh, that's going to be like a rare film artifact. That will be a. Uh... Who owns the rights to cats? Who I have no idea. Oh, it's 20th Century Fox. Uh... So Disney now. 
Oh, okay. So yeah, that will be like. So that'll never happen. No, that you know the Snyder cut, how they they use that to sell HBO Max. They're gonna use the butthole cut to see, increase Disney Plus subscriptions. See, fans on the internet can bully Warner Brothers because they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> Disney has a monopoly on the market. They cannot be bullied by anyone. Doesn't matter how angry the fans get. Uh, however, I do think the idea of somebody, I think someone's going to be so enchanted by the idea of a butthole cut that they're going to go through with After Effects and they're going to make their own. I think it's unstoppable at this point because the movie's already too horny to prevent that from happening. Well, Cats in general is too horny to prevent yeah. anything. from oh, God. But uh, we should stop talking about Cats because should we, we are now entering the most remarkable sequence in the movie. True. The dream sequence. And as much... You know, is this the most remarkable moment in the movie? I would say everything after this is Visually, really great. I would yeah. say it's the most remarkable. The most ex- outwardly expressionist version uh, or uh, uh, moment in the movie. Um, there's a lot of like comedic touches as well. So again, it's hitting on that Kafka-esque element. The size of the byline <laughs> in the paper, the murder, it's just so huge. It's like funny. And that's something that I always really appreciate when movies can portray like Kafka-esque uh, bureaucracy in a way that's also humorous. It's like that is when it's most effective is when it's horrifying and funny in equal turns. And I just love how they just went crazy with the cinematography here. Yeah. Well, you have the, the I, I was saying the slight imprisonment of the Venetian blinds earlier, but now we have like the over-the-top crisscrossing bars everywhere. Yeah. And, of course, they're able to justify it by just saying, hey, this is an anerick uh, sort of dream sequence. And I think part of the reason, again, why this movie sort of separates itself from a lot of other noirs is that they would often have more of an attachment to that hard-boiled realism uh, that people might associate with the writings of someone like Dashiell Hammett or a, or a Raymond Chandler or James and M. Kane or whatever, you know, um, where it's like, oh, these are real stories about, like, people in the streets or whatever. And they would try to do certain things that would give the movies a certain air of realism, despite the fact that they would still have this strong commitment to the chiaroscuro lighting, which is incredibly dramatic and weird, you know? Um, And you still get a lot of, like, phantasmagorical sequences in other noir movies. But I also think in those ones, in the later ones, they're more motivated by plot reasons. Like, I'm thinking specifically of the sequence in Dark Passage where Humphrey Bogart has to get his... uh, plastic surgery to change his face and he goes to this slimy back alley doctor right and this there's this horrifying kaleidoscopic sequence where he's like under he's drugged and the guy's performing surgery on his face but that's also the motivation is a lot more grounded now pay attention to this upcoming moment max because here it's coming oh there it is what do you make of that to everyone who's not watching this with us there's this weird shot but it is emphasized because they cut away to it and it's just kind of it's clearly punctuated as a shot where they're having this debate in the trial and the dream sequence and the ward character goes but i didn't do that i'm i'm not guilty and then it looks like the prosecutor stands up does a sieg hail salute and goes i object and then the judge goes shut up charles ward you're guilty Uh, I mean, it could just be the obvious thing of just, like, codifying the prosecution as just, like, this, like, evil authoritarian figure that you can't overcome, but, like... It is, but it is a Sieg Hale salute, right? Yeah. It is that. But it goes by so fucking quickly. Yes, yeah. Like, I saw it, and I'm like, am I just, like, hallucinating this? And it's like, no, it is what he's doing. This movie was made in 1940. I don't know what to make of it. Um, it's not like the movie has, as far as I can tell, any other clear, explicit references to, like, Nazi Germany. Um, And we didn't completely hate the Germans at that point. Like, there was still the... No, there was animosity, but, you know... But there was still the America First movement and the... Yes. And this is only a few years after that giant rally, uh, the disgraceful rally in Madison Square Garden. So... Um, or the friends of new Germany or whatever the fuck they were called. Like, yeah. And of course you and I are of the belief that, you know, if things had turned out differently in the war, um, the U S absolutely would have sooner allied with Nazi Germany against the Soviets than against them. 100% would have signed up with the Nazis. No problem. If the Japanese hadn't attacked Pearl Harbor, they would have been perfectly fine with it. Yeah. If only a few things had gone differently, 
I think the U S would have been fine with the Nazis. Um, I love the way Peter Lorre flips the scarf in this. I think that's one of like the characterizations he really came up with for this character where he's repeatedly doing this and something that's both kind of like sinister and sassy. (laughs) I just really like that moment. Um, but yeah, Max, I'm I'm still not entirely sure what to make of that Sea Kale sort of salute. I can tell you that some of the people who worked on this movie did leave Germany in the 30s. Uh, people like Boris Ingster, who I don't really know much about, but I can tell you that after his filmmaker career, he became an influencer on Instagram. So got that joke out of the way. Um, I'm just gonna let you sit in that one. <laughs> But seriously, Boris Ingster, I think another reason why this movie might be overlooked compared to something like The Maltese Falcon is maybe because The Maltese Falcon was directed by noted auteur John Huston. Uh, and Boris Ingster, what do we know about the guy? He was he studied with uh, Sergei Eisenstein. I know that. He worked with him. Uh, and then he did stuff at Ufa in Germany. That's pretty much all I know. Um but it's possible that he also had some sort of political affiliation where he, you know, having worked with Eisenstein, maybe he's a little bit more politically aware of certain things. Could I can be. tell you that there's lots of stories from Peter Lorre being Jewish and his flight from Germany um, where, uh, you know, I think you can go back and forth much like with Fritz Lang about whether or not this is 100% true. But there's lots of stories of versions of a story where Peter Lorre was out like rehearsing for a movie or something and then he gets like a story from or he like his barber or whatever on set or something says to him like you probably shouldn't go home today and it was the day of the Reichstag fire he's like you know what don't go back to your house today in fact you should just leave after you should leave right now and peter lorry left germany from the film set and he got out and we don't know what might have happened if he went home Again, maybe apocryphal, but clearly there was a lot of talent uh, from Germany and Austria in Hollywood around this time. And honestly, I think it's probably easier to find some sort of um, political anxiety over the Nazis and America from these exiles from Germany than it is to find some sort of clear lineage uh, between noir and German expressionism, to be honest with you. Yeah, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have to remember, German Expressionism was not the only sort of uh, movement in film going on around that time that had really stark contrast in lighting and like low key lighting setups. There was also like uh, French poetic realism and all that stuff. And even the French, when they talk about film noir, it was a term that they had used for their own movies a little bit beforehand, before they started applying them to the US movies. So it was not a completely unknown thing over there as well. Either way, Max, I think that's the one riddle that we're going to be walking away with this movie from. Uh, Because I'm still not entirely sure what to make of it. But it is clear to me that this movie wants to portray this justice justice system as flawed, um, is very anxious about it, and it wants to show it being kind of like authoritarian and um, very eager to persecute, I think is the other thing. Like they're they're very zealous in going after well, he's, people. Well, he's he's now imagining what it would be like for him if he got the same kind of trial of the man that he put away yes. earlier in the and film. And that's of course that whole dream sequence with Elisha Cook Jr. pops up at the end. And he's like, "Ha! Look at you now. You're fucked." To quote exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's what he. It was you're very, fucked, kid. It was a very strange departure from the yeah. period authentic dialogue <laughs> up until <laughs> yes. then. Yes, the Hayes office was furious. <laughs> like you said the word fuck. We were going to have graphic sex scenes in this movie, but we cut them all out so we could say fuck one time. That's how the Hays Code worked, right? Yeah. No, what happened was uh, Joseph Breen just cut everything from your movie and then threatened your kids or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Just kicked you in the balls. (laughs) It's like you've been warned. (laughs) They're not going to sleep in the same bed together or else I'm taking your other nut with me. (laughs) I always think about, like, I know it can't be possible, but what if Neil Breen is related to Joseph Breen? I know that can't be the case, but, like, what if? 
he's trying to ruin film in a completely different <laughs> way decades <laughs> later. <laughs> At the curse of the Breen line, they just keep coming back to like ruining movies. And they all, at the same time, they think they're doing a service to them the entire time. <laughs> yes. They're just delusional, they, all of them. It'd be the most deluded family in existence. That's amazing. At the same time, Max, I don't know. If you're asking me to go to a movie theater to see a movie, and you're asking me be- between like Marvel number 71 or... Oh, I'll see a Neil Breen movie yeah. 10 times out of 10, but like... yeah. But it doesn't mean he's doing a good job. No, the man is deeply disturbed. And the fact that like he refuses to let his movies go on late at night because he thinks that makes them legitimate movies. Yeah. (laughs) Not the content of the film, but it's that it plays at 730. Did he ever learn to use Twitter correctly? Do you know about this? No, I didn't. Where, like, he, for a long time, apparently, he didn't know how to respond to people on Twitter, so he'd just tweet random things, like he was responding to a question, but it wouldn't be at anyone. He would just say, like, yes. And that would be its own tweet. (laughs) He's the craziest man ever. Oh, God. I didn't even know he knew, like, how to actually use a computer. All of his... Well, apparently, he doesn't. Yeah, apparently, because all of his laptops are broken and all of his No more books. Yeah. No more books. Just computers. So you know who else this character, this protagonist reminds me of that we've done on the show is Guy from uh, Strangers on the Train, which is another sort of like doofus character who like suffers from, but what if they say I did it? Yeah. And also similar to Strangers on a Train where the flamboyant yeah, villain character is far more interesting <laughs> than they are the entire film. Yes. Exactly. The same way. <gasps> oh my God. The same man killed them both. The stranger on the third floor. You have the Arc de Triomphe in the background. What is that? I, I've I've been to New York. Is that something they just destroyed to No. That's like in Columbus Circle or whatever. Is it? Yeah. No, what I'm really waiting for, every time I see a a, uh, Central Park scene in New York, I'm just waiting for the moment from Inferno. For the guy at the, like, hot dog (laughs) stand to just run over and stab them randomly. (laughs) It would improve a lot of movies. That might. I want the next shitty rom com that has like <laughs> this, this up minded business woman only can focus on business, but this laid back guy doesn't know how to take things seriously. She's got to pull up her ass, and he can't get his shit together. And then just one of them gets stabbed and killed in the middle of the movie. Or by their it. friend, or whatever, is like trying to hook them up, and it's like, oh, their friend is like feeding him information through like a, a an earpiece, and he's like hiding behind a bush, and then suddenly <laughs> you cut to the other direction. He's like, wait. No, no, there's a guy coming and it's the butcher from Inferno. <laughs> That'd be so good. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh my God. You're in trouble, Ward. Look out. <laughs> you think the fucking foreigner would notice this oh yeah that's right i forgot about that my job i mean again you can nitpick certain parts of it but it's oh, you can nitpick a lot of this movie but yeah i don't want to i mean it is very much melodrama so there's a certain accepted level of artifice to the plotting and i'm glad you sort of point out those inconsistencies because it really helps ca- like characterize the way in which this movie works it is uh kind of like melodrama where it's like very much uh contriving a situation to achieve a certain type of like thematic irony, you know? It's definitely not about realism in the same way as the other noir movies. In terms of comparing this to other noir movies, another thing that it kind of doesn't have is a femme fatale. Yeah. There's no temptress. There's nobody. Yeah. And I can certainly see for some people, if they consider the femme fatale to be the defining feature of noir, 
uh, they could easily say that this does not belong in any categorization of noir. I don't agree with that, but I can see someone making that argument. Again, gender is something that I think other noir movies would take a more explicit interest in. This movie has an interest in the idea of sexuality, but it's not its not like an idea of lust. It's like an idea of perversion and voyeurism. That's what it's interested in, in terms of bizarre sexuality. Um, and sexual frustration, and how that like sort of uh, crosses uh, with uh, economic struggle as well. Where these people, one of the things I was wondering, Max, is like, okay, does these apartments even have a kitchen? Is that why they have to eat at this, you know, uh, pharmacy every morning? You know? Yeah. So it's like it kind of has a post depression air about it as well, where it's like these people struggling to get by and it, it becomes this very um, cutthroat scenario where it's like him for, in order for him to like get forward, he has to embody this sort of surveillance um, mindset that makes him an arm of the state and prosecute innocent people in order to meet the standards for justice. Um, so uh, yeah, it's not really about gender quite as much. Which can be good because the femme fatale is normal. It is a yeah, mainstay of the noir genre. But like, if you were to insert a femme fatale character in this movie, not sure how it would work. I I, I guess it would have to be like a rival love interest. So like, oh, but you're getting paid more money if you testify. Something more him. similar to yeah. Sunrise, which yeah. again, linking it to German expressionism. You know, I can easily see people connecting the femme fatale archetype to that sort of vamp uh, flapper 20s woman who, like the woman from the city in Sunrise, is just an evil seduct seductress who's going to take all the man's money and convince him to murder his wife. <laughs> but, but you're right. I'm not really sure where a femme fatale would fit in this story. That's comically, but I'm sorry. She's been great this entire movie, but that's some comically bad physical acting there. What? Of just her, like, doing her job and then comically, like, okay, now I am spacing out. Time to put pencil in my mouth. <laughs> she's she's very charming and very plays her role very well for the rest of the movie, though. At that moment just stuck out to me as very bizarre and weird. Yeah, I don't know. I don't... It doesn't really bother me as much because I don't consider these performances to be aiming for any sort of naturalism. You know, it's kind of okay that they're playing, like, stock characters, and again, I think... No, it's not the stock character, Nessa. It's just... But I also think they're playing stock moments. Yeah. The moments they're playing are stock moments for stock characters. And I think it becomes more interesting if you're Peter Laurie or Elisha Cook Jr., but for everyone else, it is just kind of cardboard. <laughs> um, but I think as long as you have the foil of the good actors, you can get away with it. Yes. Yeah. I guess I just want a consistently weird performance the entire movie. And you feel like it's been wavering? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, examples of people who can do that nowadays and it's a little bit better are people like David Lynch, where obviously they have the very uh, alienating um, sort of uh, pseudo wooden acting style. But again, he's directly hearkening back to movies like this and trying to sort of uh, alienate you to a certain type of artifice oh, in the story. What's David Lynch's short film on Netflix now? The Monkey? The Jack one, yeah. Yeah, where he's interrogating the monkey. Yes, uh, if any of our listeners have not seen David Lynch's short film on Netflix uh, where he is interrogating a monkey in a film noir style, please check that out. It is very, very well done. I'm not even a huge David Lynch fan, and <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed every minute of that. Apparently, he had been wanting to do that for a long years time. and years. That was like his passion project. <laughs> it's like, you just needed a monkey, man. You can't get a monkey? You're David Lynch. I think you could get a monkey. I think it was just like getting anybody to put that out <laughs> and agree to give him money to do Why it. is that such a hard th thing to do? We should have gone to him and said, David, you can put this on our website, yeah. your monkey thing. We'll, in fact, we'll remove every other movie from our website. We will change our website. All zero of them. David Lynch's. David Lynch's monkey thing. Yeah. Oh, God. I think I've brought this up recently, but I, I just recently rewatched uh, Female Trouble. I wanted to show it to my sister for the first time. Oh, how did that go? Uh, she actually really liked it. Yeah. Because her boyfriend had been forcing her to watch like boring, benign things recently, so it was a nice... Oh, well, you got to force the boyfriend to watch Female yeah. Trouble. Uh, yeah. It was a nice change of pace for her, but um, I that's one of my favorite 
just photos and film history of a young David Lynch and a young John Waters shaking hands in front of a Bob's Big Boy <laughs> mascot. It's great. Classic. It's like right when Eraserhead had come out. So here we are, Max. We're about to be introduced to Peter Lorre. Yes. Have you ever seen Peter Lorre in uh, many other movies? Um, a couple of things, like Casablanca, obviously, sure. and whatnot. Yeah. But And as you pointed out, he's been in movies that we did for the like previews before we started the podcast. No. Nope. Um, you literally said that beforehand. No. Waldo Lidecker and Laura. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, but no, I, I had gone through his... Uh, catalog and i have seen him in several other things although he was apparently most well known at the time for a bunch of like serial movies that he had been in which i had mr moto <laughs> yeah which i have not seen any of which i've never seen any of them either i didn't know anything about them but his presence is instantly hypnotizing whenever yes. he's on screen um it's not just his physicality it's just that he knows perfectly what to do in front of a camera in the way he elicits uh sympathy from you while also being very frightening at different moments, is really incredible. And the movie, I love how the movie treats him because it totally understands what they have with him, where he asks for, like, raw meat from the counter of this deli, and you're like, what is this guy, a fucking werewolf or something? <laughs> and, and then it's like, oh, no, he's sweet. He's feeding a dog outside. And, of course, the funny thing about Peter Lorre is that he can play the ambiguity between those two things perfectly. He is someone who looks so innocent that he could just be feed feeding a stray dog. Or he could be a fucking werewolf that is going to, like, bite into your arm. I mean, his teeth are... Look at that. Yeah, this was before he got his teeth fixed. So that's natural, actually. Okay. I, I mean, pe people had uh, teeth I know problems. that, yeah. But, like, I just thought that might have been a prosthetic to, like, nope. add to make him look weirder. Nope. And, of course, I also think part of his casting in this is... Less to do with stuff like Mr. Moto and definitely more related to his uh, his amazing role in M, which M was a well-known and well-received movie even at the time. And I just think the way he plays this character is really impressive. Um, and I really love how they allow his character the space to be completely sincere. I feel like that's something that you might not get from other noir movies where they're all about people sort of playing off of one another, where his sincerity in this movie really makes him the victim. Yeah. Um, and it's not just his sincerity in like, you know, feeding the dog and everything. It's a sincerity about like being honest about killing those people where he's so honest about it. He doesn't even know that it's wrong and he just, you know, blurts it out to this woman. Yeah. Cause she's like the only one that like, has gives, talked to him or gives whatever. Gives him the time of day. Yeah. And it's just like so, uh, I don't know. It's upsetting. It's even more upsetting, I think, with hindsight. I think the performance staged even better when he's talking about being sent back to the like insane asylum because I don't know if there would have been as much of a common conception of what was done to people at insane asylums at the time that we might have a better understanding of now. Yeah. It's like, who knows what the fuck they were doing to this guy? The fact that they let him out is astonishing in general. But they didn't let him out. Is it implied he escaped? Or that was my understanding. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that you know, Meng and Nick, because they like Ward, are kind of like observers and voyeurs going around the city and uh, are surveilling everything, threatened to uh, send him back. One of the most amazing things I think about Peter Lorre's face is how his face retained like a certain type of like baby fat uh, and how that plays with just like the roundness of his eyes. He just definitely, he has one of the most unique faces of any actor in cinema. And of course I think the doubling here with Peter Lorre is that he's kind of more explicitly the, um, you know, mentally enfeebled version of the Ward character 
but it's expressing itself in different ways. Ward has that like verging on psychotic paranoid breakdown, but Peter Lorre is so like abused and yeah. like dejected that he like doesn't even know where he is anyway. He's pathetic. He's sense. kind of like the stray dog. He just yeah. knows that he's trying to stay alive. You know, he doesn't really have a goal in mind with anything or he's just he's just sort of keeping an eye over his shoulder and uh, trying to stay alive. <laughs> I would just be like, no, I'm not going to leave. <laughs> Call the police, please. Yeah, we have I the mean, same goal. It is, it is kind of funny that that woman's like, fuck off. And then she slams the door in her face. <laughs> Oh, it's so threatening. Effortlessly, too. Yes. And again, if we're going to talk about the legacy of this movie and of Peter Lorre in general, going back to the Jalo, I think that like the Jalo killer can find its um, its uh, cinematic ancestor in the killers portrayed by Peter Lorre, where there is this interesting overlap of like fetishism to the violence that he performs. Again, originating with M. Uh, and, uh, this specifically like, um, sort of grotesque, like visual features that come with the killer, sort of like the outfits and everything. I do find this a bit anticlimactic, but like it when is he comical. Gets hit by the car. This is the only car we see drive the entire movie <laughs> and it kills somebody. <laughs> I, I think it maybe is anticlimactic, but I think the this scene is very powerful. And I think it's interesting what the driver says, too. My, now, it's not my help, fault, miss. I couldn't help it. I honked. You can't s- stop one of these things in five feet. You'll be a witness for me, won't you? So once again, it's turning even his death into this situation where it's like just another opportunity for the state to just bring the hammer down on someone. And it's all about like the levels of like interacting voyeurism between these different people and who's going to testify to what to make this person guilty or innocent in the eyes of the law. You know, it's like just a massive game of uh, musical chairs. And then sometimes some people are, are instead of sitting in the musical chair sent to the electric chair. Goodbye, Peter Laurie. It was wonderful having you. Yes. And then we have this very uh, off-putting ending sequence, which is a a mirroring of the beginning. But I think this ending sequence kind of reminds me of the ending of The Last Laugh, another Murnau movie, um, where that movie was famously uh, rejected by the studios at first because they're like, this is way too sad at the end. And then Murnau kind of won because he came up with an ending that was like too happy. And it's like, okay, this is this guy's fantasy then it's like we're retreating into his mind now. And I'm not saying literally we're retreating into the mind of the characters, but it shows us such irreconcilable contradictions of all these different people in the society and how it equalizes them. So it's like, wow, Ward really isn't that different from Peter Lorre or Elisha Cook Jr. And then we have this over the top giddy, happy sequence where like Elisha Cook Jr. is like, we're getting a house. We're getting married. married. We can finally fuck. (laughs) And Elisha Cook Jr. is like, I'll watch. And he's like, he uh, gives him a free ride in the taxi. He forgave them very quickly for yes. almost getting him the electric chair. Yes, very quickly. I would be much more upset about that. Um, but yeah, that's the movie. It's only an hour long. Um, there's still plenty of stuff we could have talked about, I think. Um, but I don't know. I think it's just a very rich movie. And I think it's a very um, worthwhile entry in any conversation of noir not only for the novelty and the fact that it's the first one chronologically just because it introduces a lot of these key things while at the same same time differentiating itself from how we would come to know them later on it's like a delicious european like pastry or dessert it's small portion but it's very finely crafted and you fully appreciate it rather than just a bloated gigantic ben and jerry's tub of things that you might get in longer you know, no I'm going to say that movies. metaphor is a little confusing, but I do love food metaphors. So we're going to let it pass. Okay. And if you'd like to eat from the buffet that is the Spectator <laughs> Film Podcast, you can find more. The cheap, cheap buffet. <laughs> the cheap buffet that will make you shit your brains out after. 
You can find more episodes at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or find our episodes on Spotify, iTunes, or Stitcher, and YouTube now. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yes. And we have our letterbox, which, as usual, I cannot remember the username, uh, but you can find it on our website. And uh, Max has an OnlyFans, of course, where uh, Max will go... Only for Tier 5 uh, Patreon subscribers, yes, though. Yes, yes, yes. 